Podcast. I'm your host, Lori Brooks, and this is episode 30. Thank you once again for joining me, guys. This week, we are joined by Lois Ratz, who for more than 25 years has helped over 4,000 individuals and organizations improve their results using a comprehensive, solution-focused approach to change and growth. Lois has made it her life's work to understand growth from as many perspectives as possible in order to be able to simplify complex issues and clarify the best strategies for moving forward in any situation. Lois is the founder of Ready to Grow. Ready to Grow is a consulting firm which equips business owners with all the skills, tools, resources, and connections they need to take their business to its next level. Hey, yeah, I'm great. How are you? I'm excellent, thank you. What we would love to know is a story about how it is that you once saw the future before you decided to begin branding yourself and building out the Ready to Grow business. Oh, that's a great question. Thanks for asking that. I had actually been working uh, as an organization development specialist and working with larger businesses. And then one day I attended a discussion forum that was focused more on the small business entrepreneur. And looking around the table, I immediately knew that this was more the market I wanted to focus on. There's a few different reasons for that. Because I love being able to make an, have an immediate impact on the, on the business by working with the owner. And I love that I can help owners create more jobs by expanding and bringing in more revenue. And, and then it's a real pleasure to know I'm making a difference in the lives of some of our most creative and talented people because that's what entrepreneurs are. I just love working with them and helping them make their vision a reality by setting up the right systems that and people that actually make that vision work. Excellent. So uh, initially you were working with um, organizations and as the organization specialist and then you kind of began focusing on the entrepreneurial market. But before you began focusing on that market, what did you think life would look like? Did you always think about becoming an entrepreneur, or did you have something else in mind? Oh, that's a great question. No, I, I started on a completely different track, Lori. I was actually working in counseling uh, for the first part of my career. So I focused on the people side of things, uh, but more in terms of helping them move forward with their lives. And then back in the early 2000s, I started to stream more towards the business world because I actually had a background in career development. So it made sense uh, in the sense that it's always about people and their work, their relationship, and how that how that works out for them. So um, then I focused on organization development, and then from there I thought, no, it's entrepreneur, uh, the entrepreneurial world that I really want to focus on. So no, it's it's really what, and that, this is the case with most entrepreneurs. We don't yeah. always end up with the vision that we started with. And uh, the, the difference between an entrepreneur and say another type of person is that the entrepreneur will see the opportunity and will gravitate towards it as opposed to running away from it. Right. 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 And that's kind of a piece that I was hoping that the audience would really have the opportunity to hear is really recognizing that entrepreneurs, all entrepreneurs, start in one place, but their path, their journey is going to lead them in a direction that they may not have really looked at as being the path that they were planning to be on in the first place. So that's kind of why I, I bring that question up is to kind of see what it was that you were doing before you began branding yourself because there's always a, a story before the business came along. So definitely once you decided that you were really more interested in working with entrepreneurs and kind of combining your experience from the business end and the counseling end, what were some of the first steps that you took once you decided it was time to go ahead and begin uh, building your business? Well, I was uh, in fear and trepidation in a sense because I'd always, I, I've never worked really much in like a full-time permanent type of job anyway. I'd always worked on contract, but the fact was I always, <clears throat> I always had contracts that I could rely on. And then when I started Ready to Grow, it was a different kind of business, and I knew that I would have to take the leap at some point to, to just stop working on contract for someone else and start focusing on my business. So I did that in 2007, and that was a hard move to make. I, I actually quit the contract I was working with, and I said, I'm just going to do this full time, and it's probably going to be painful for a little while, but that's what I'm going to do. Right. That's, that's excellent. So you decided to make the choice to 
severed ties with the hourly wage uh, billing that you were doing with contracted clients and move full force into focusing on your own business. All right. What did you feel like was one of the hardest parts of doing that? What did you, you know, I, I can imagine leaving contracted work behind uh, had to have been, you know, a, a difficult thing in and of itself. But what do you feel like was one of the one of the hardest parts of becoming an entrepreneur? Well, I, I share that um, creative spirit that most entrepreneurs that I know have. And most of us are what I would call visionary. So we can kind of see an opportunity and want to move into it, but we don't always know how. So we can we get the vision of how we want it to look, but then putting, you know, creating the, the, the goals and the projects and the task lists and the connections we have to make and weaving that all together so the thing that we envision gets produced, that's the hardest part. Uh, for, it was for me, and, and I know it is for a lot of the owners I work with. That's that's why I really value doing this work because I know how valuable it is to the owners. Um, so I always had a vision of where I wanted to go with the business, and the hardest part was creating all the different systems. But that was been what's been invaluable because that's really helped me to be very practical in the um, help that I offer my clients. It's uh, I don't come in with an MBA and a bunch of theories. Like I actually teach people what works. <laughs> I love that, Lois. <laughs> um, how do you feel that technology helps you in that respect in terms of creating your systems and procedures? Uh, so there's been a lot of ways in which technology has helped me. It, it's also hindered me in some ways. Um, <laughs> it's it, Because if you don't have the right technology or you haven't got the right platforms, you can waste a lot of time. But in, yeah. that, all that being said, I would say that social media has helped me a lot with branding and marketing. Um, online sales does require a targeted email list, so you can make targeted offers uh, to special needs and markets. And so I've always worked hard to have the capability to have that sort of list. And then, so you need a website that, at the very least, uh, has a sales page that's going to motivate people to give you their contact information and helps have a free download or an event or some something that people are willing to exchange their connections their contact information with you so that you can continue to communicate with them. And then you got to provide stuff that's um, helpful to them because otherwise why would they give you their email? So um, you need you need the, the database and the email distribution system or CRM, Customer Relationship Management System, that supports you so you can send out um, things that are valuable to your audience. So, and, you, and if you want to, for people who are just starting, um, you know, there's lots of free CRMs out there like MailChimp or Constant Contact or iContact or Sugar CRM. Mm -hmm. um, then from there, the next level up would be A Weaver, Infusionsoft, Get Response. I use Infusionsoft, but um, I, I still find it complicated, and I actually have a virtual assistant who helps me set things up like campaigns. The second thing in terms of um, streamlining my procedures is I use uh, Gmail and Google Calendar, but I also use um, Asana for tasks, and so. Every entrepreneur always has a million things to do, and it's really important to have them in one place. I've used all kinds of systems for that, including Outlook and, uh, you know, the, the, the Google system. But nothing works as well for me as Asana because it's a really good project management system, and it can be adapted in a variety of ways to suit anybody. The other thing I use is uh, Schedule Once because that allows people to go online and book a time with me, so I don't have to be going back and forth via email. And I really like the Schedule Once platform. I've tried other ones, and this is the one that works really well for me. And then um, in terms of uh, social media, I, I found that that got very time-consuming and distracting for me because, I mean, I, it's really it's so easy to go online and get sucked in, right? Yeah. Uh, so, and so for social media, I use Buffer because I can schedule all my tweets ahead of time and post mm -hmm. some things that I want to include, and I can um, make them appear more than once if I want my own stuff to go out. So I don't have to get di as distracted by social media. So I would really, I would really encourage people to use a platform like, um, like Buffer or Hootsuite or Ed Edgar. There's, there's different ones that can be used for uh, social media. And then uh, for performing market research, I've used SurveyMonkey, which is an awesome platform, and then Twitter and LinkedIn and Facebook to get feedback um, on different projects I've, I've started. So those are all really useful ways to use technology uh, to, you know, to build out your business. 
Certainly, Lois, you are awesome. You packed so much into that just now. It was amazing. So I'm going to go ahead and recap really quick <laughs> just to make sure that the audience actually had the opportunity to kind of catch all of that because that was outstanding. When you are using technology to build out your business, as we, as you mentioned, you've really used all of the tools to help you streamline, A, the processes that you do on a regular day-to-day -day basis, but not only streamline, you've used the tools to help you avoid what our former guests and, and fellow podcast host John Dumas has coined the phrase, weapons of mass distraction. Uh -huh. So by using, you know, the, the technology, you've allowed yourself to free up some time by avoiding those distractions and, and streamlining the processes that you do have. And you threw out some really great pieces of, of info on different um, programs. So I'm going to go ahead and link to all of those from the show notes page, the buffer.com, schedule one, schedule um, a Weber and Hootsuite. Um, I'll be sure to link to all of those, and I'll just mention to you that I actually myself use GetResponse, and I find that it's probably the easiest of the platforms in terms of building out that campaign. So definitely try taking a look at that. Um, you know, it might be a little more on the simple side versus uh, the the program that you're currently using in in that respect. Um, and your VA may absolutely just love making the switch because it really is uh, very similar to. HTML5 technology where it's more of a, a drag and drop in terms of creating the campaign itself with a, a calendar built out for you. So, um, yeah, I, I definitely tend to use that as well. I have not touched Asana ever. So, Lois, thank you for bringing a new piece of tech over to the show. I will definitely be checking that out and linking to that from the show notes page as well. Um, so, Lois, what do you feel are some of the key metrics? We've discussed, you know, the technology different platforms that you've used to kind of streamline some of those processes, but what do you feel are some of the key metrics that a newbie should focus on when they are performing their market research and beginning to build out those processes? I find that uh, they have to know how to think about market research. So um, I may not describe so much metrics, but more like how you should think about um, getting the information you need. So the first thing any newbie should do is a lot of talking with their target market. And you can do this both face-to-face -face and online. Uh, the more you talk with people, the better you're going to understand where they're coming from. And then you also can get feedback on what they think of your product or service so you can then tweak it and adapt it to the to meet their needs. So um, I remember when I was first, um, you know, way back in their mid 2000s, I guess it was. I, I I first met Ryan Alice. He's the founder of Eye Contact, and I first met him in an online forum. And at that <coughs> point, he was just starting his business, and he was using online means to reach out and and establish the connections that actually built his business. And then he sold that business in, in 2012 for $169 million. So it is really important to like really keep in touch with your target market. He clearly knew how to do that. So as you talk, if you talk with your target audience, you should really develop three different visuals. And so I'd like to describe those right now. Uh, you can make a, like a diagram or a chart and you can go and look online for these terms. So that if you don't already know what they mean, you can go find out information about them. Um, so can I take a minute and do that now? Please. Please. Okay. So the first one would be called an empathy map. And this, uh, this answers the question about who's at the center of all your business efforts. And so it's actually a good idea to get a photo that represents this target person. If it's a, you know, maybe it's a young mom or maybe it's a, you know, a senior business executive or maybe it's an, you know, a construction guy. Uh, so you'll probably uh, have more than one of these, but start with at least one and use the empathy map format. And what that does, and you can, you can use a visual or you can actually put this into an Excel spreadsheet. Uh, what this does is it looks at what's going through that person's mind as, as they're thinking about buying your product or service. So you want to know not only what's going through their mind, but what are they feeling? What are they seeing? Who are they talking to? What are they experiencing? as they're thinking about um, purchasing your product or service. And from that empathy map, then you develop the second thing, which is a buyer persona. And with the buyer persona, you're trying to answer the question, what is this person's biggest challenge that your product or service is going to solve? So that helps you build out your unique service or sales proposition or unique value proposition. 
Um, it helps you to develop your messaging. It helps you develop your communications. And so you're thinking about what are all the reasons that this person's likely to buy from you? And what are all the reasons they might actually be likely to reject your offer? And how are you planning to counter those objections? So that's a really important thinking process to go through, the buyer persona. And then the third thing is the buyer process map. And that shows, uh, I usually do it from left to right so you can see it all at once. You're, you're thinking about the different uh, experiences your buyer is going through as they're considering buying your product or service from start to finish. So how are they going to hear about you in the first place? Uh, you start there on the left and then you say, okay, well, now that they've heard about you, what's the next kind of information they are going to want to know about you and, and where are they going to find that? And then go from there all the way to the point where they've bought your product or service. And that allows you to construct your content. Um, if you're going to have a content uh, program for uh, marketing, then it allows you to construct content that's going to actually map to the things that they're experiencing and thinking as they're going to buy your product or service. So those are three really important components of you know, constructing any kind of marketing or sales process. That was outstanding, Lois. I don't think we've had any other guests whatsoever. Uh, nor has the host myself taken the time to explain that to the audience. That was outstanding. When doing the market research, you really do want to kind of walk through your tar target audience and define them as clearly as humanly possible so that when you are creating your marketing materials, your marketing materials are speaking to that audience wholly to pull them through, uh, you know, your sales funnel, so to speak. Um, so starting off with the empathy map, as you called it, the buyer persona, and the buyer process map. So I'll definitely try to summarize those for the audience on the show notes page as well, Lois. That was outstanding. Thank you. Um, <laughs> when you are going through um, those three pieces, uh, the empathy map, the buyer persona, the buyer process map, um, this kind of leads into that next question of a limit, either minimum or maximum, to the amount of research that's being done. Because I find that sometimes I will definitely get caught up in stalling on a project simply because I'm doing so much research on a project. You know what I mean? Um, and it, there's definitely times when I've worked with clients who have a similar situation where they're not moving forward more so because they've just been focusing so much on, on what that customer base might look like and, and what it is. Um, that's, a, that's a really, really important question and has to do with uh, probably another question we might want to discuss is, because uh, we can get caught up in that um, information gathering research process. Many people love to do that. So, like, we, and entrepreneurs tend to do more of what they love. So, if we love research, yes. we're going to want to do more research, right? But we have to be careful because um, the most important thing in entrepreneurship is moving forward. And you have to be able to move forward with limited information. You'll never have enough information, you, there's always more to get. And every product or service will be, will be different in the amount of information that's required. Now, in my case, I launched a consulting service um, that had a coaching component. Um, but the, the way I did it when I first started, um, and I'd actually by this point launched a couple of other businesses as well in a similar fashion. Uh, so I usually just start by talk, walking around and talking about what I do. And especially in, in what I can provide for people or what results they're going to get um, as a result of taking advantage of my service. Now, it might be a little bit different with a product. You need, might need, um, you know, more, um, more background just because you're going to actually have to invest in order to create the product. But um, I actually chose my name and my tagline based on what resonated with the people in front of me. So I could tell by their, by their facial expressions uh, online. I can tell by their reactions. And then, and then um, I chose Ready to Grow on that basis because whenever I mentioned that name, uh, people's eyes would light up and they say, oh, that's a great name or, oh, yeah, I get what you do. And so that was cool. And then um, I also tested my tagline, uh, Your Growth is Our Business. Um, and I tested it at a few different points at the start and, that, and you know, it was just a couple years ago. And it actually stood the test of time. So I'm probably going to keep that one, even though it doesn't encapsulate every aspect of what I do. It's probably good enough. So I built the various components of my offerings based on the feedback I was getting. And that's, that's really the best way to do things is just to move forward with something. 
Um, and not everything will work. Like I've created a program called Market to Grow, which is an awesome program, but it wasn't just the right program at the right time. So I'm probably going to reshape that. And that was based on feedback I got from the marketplace. And uh, so it's really important that people just keep just keep moving. Just keep moving. Don't get too perfectionistic. Yes. There definitely comes a time when you have heard what the audience has said, you listen to what they're saying, and you take that feedback and kind of just keep it moving and, and get on to the next project. It's a matter of motivating yourself to really uh, just go ahead and say, this is enough. I know in my gut this is what they're looking for. Move forward with that. And then you can always get feedback and tweak and change and, and move forward even more. Um, so excellent. Do you think that there's anything in particular Lois, that prospective entrepreneurs should really take into consideration prior to taking the leap or, or starting their own business? Um, I think that they need to understand their own um, um, relationship with risk. There's higher mm -hmm. risk businesses and lower risk businesses. There's, um, you know, and if they're not willing to take the risk, then they need to understand uh, what that's about. Uh, because once they get into it, there's going to be things that come up. And they have to be prepared to um, encounter some uh, discomfort. They they need to be prepared to stick it out, to persist, even when the going gets rough. They need to have ways to motivate themselves and overcome their negative self-talk and not take things personally. So there's got to be a lot of inner resilience that gets create that you know like that that they have as they're moving into the entrepreneurship mode. Uh, if they don't have that inner resilience, they need to start developing it, and that probably would be just as important as developing a product or service that they can take to market. So there's really the two components. There's the product or service itself, um, but there's also that inner resilience that needs to get developed. Lois, thank you. <laughs> thank you, thank you for that. That was outstanding because when I work with financial service agents and clients and so forth, um, they, of course, use what is called, and m many of you may know this having done any financial planning for yourself previously, a risk tolerance profile. And what this does for the client is it really allows them to figure out how they honestly do feel about what levels of risk they're willing to take when they are about to go ahead and begin investing their money into any particular funds. And I think that is an outstanding thing for an entrepreneur to kind of try to do for themselves. Really take note of your own risk levels. And that's really important, Lois. I don't think anyone else has, has brought that up at all. Um, knowing what your level of risk tolerance is, is extremely important because if you find that your risk tolerance is low, entrepreneurship is probably not the journey for you. People burn out fast. Um, you know, it, it's, it's a road that can be uh, daunting, difficult, and it's definitely bumpy. Uh, it looks differently for everyone. Um, so to know where you stand in, in terms of your own risk levels is, is extremely important, Lois. Thank you, thank you, thank you for that. Um, One more thing I wanted to add is, is please. for that question, and that has to do with identifying your strengths. There's a really good profile that you can take um, online. It's called the Clifton Strengths Finder, and um, I did this when I started Ready to Grow, and I just I found that it gave me some insights that were invaluable. Uh, it gives you your top five. This is research that's done through the Gallup organization, and they're the you know the, the kings of uh, of research. Um, so you really get a, a good sense of where you should focus your time and energy and where you should not. So, for example, two of my top strengths are strategy and ideation. So that means a couple of things. One is that um, I should be spending like 80% of my time doing those two things because um, if I'm not, I'm kind of wasting my strengths. So that's why, in my case, I delegate as much of the um, administrative stuff to other people as I can because it's really a waste of my time and energy even though I can st I can do it. It's just not the best use of my time and energy. So that's another piece of the puzzle for prospective entrepreneurs. Know what your strengths are and don't be afraid to delegate. Even if it costs you, there's, there's going to be a return on that investment. Um, if, you know, if you're not good at bookkeeping, do not do your bookkeeping. Give it to somebody else. <laughs> 
<laughs> Undoubtedly. Definitely. Learn how and when it's time to begin delegating those tasks so that you do have the opportunity to continue working on your business and working on yourself in the areas that are going to serve you best in the end. Um, so, excellent. Uh, what do you feel like you would caution as, as the biggest mistake first-time entrepreneurs tend to make? Well, I'll refer back to my previous answer, and that really is perfectionism and overthinking. Um, I'm, a, I'm a thinker by nature, and I, I will overthink things unless I curb myself away from that. So, um, so knowing what your strengths are, and maybe you're a real action person, and what you need to do is um, step back and think about things from time to time. That can be the other way of looking at it. So you want to really make, compensate for your, like, focus on your strengths, but find ways to compensate for your weaknesses so that your your business isn't suffering because you're this whole you've got this whole other thing going on, um, and I guess another thing related to that would then don't spend a lot of time designing the perfect logo, website, sales page, and so on because that's all going to change within a year. You can mm-hmm. practically guarantee it. So you want to get a working draft and then you want to get it out there, and then you want to assume it's going to need to change within a couple years for sure. So. Um, so then that takes me to another part, which is don't spend money on stuff that doesn't matter. Like what matters is what the client needs from you and then how you're providing it better than some other person or had some other business. And that's, that's really the key to success. So you need to be willing to make decisions and move forward, even when you have only 60% information in the service of the client. That's really what it's all about. Sure. Excellent, Lois. Um, I really think that you have shown the audience that it's extremely important to realistically know themselves um, before going into entrepreneurship. Um, because if you don't really know yourself, what your own strengths are, what your uh, weaknesses are, you know, what your passion is, uh, and and really figuring out who you are and what your risk levels are, um, it can be a much bumpier road than necessary. So hopefully what we can do is help to smooth some of the bumps in the road that may still be there. Lois, the show is really designed to help entrepreneurs come up with ideas for new innovative companies and business ideas to help solve the pain in an industry that they may not have thought of. So we'd love to help you. If you had a magic wand and could change anything at all in your business, what would it be and why? That is such a great question, and I so appreciate that. And I don't exactly know what the answer is, but um, I, even though I, um, I do market my business and I do help other people market my business or their businesses, sorry, um, I, I wish I didn't have to do marketing. I would just love to have an army of ambassadors who would help me get the word out there that it's a good idea to get help and support to, to grow your business, to move forward to the next level. And so that, I don't know how, um, I don't mean that to be a frivolous answer, but that's kind of like, that's what I need the most. Certainly. It's totally understood. It tends to be a resounding answer, uh, you know, in terms of marketing being one of the more challenging pieces in the business. You know, once you have your idea and you're running with this golden, uh, you know, piece of information, it's it's difficult to make sure that everyone knows that that information is actually available. Um, so hopefully we are going to help you out with uh, getting some sort of exposure here and, and moving right along. But Lois, we want to say thank you, thank you, thank you for joining us this morning. You have been absolutely outstanding. You've provided a million golden nuggets that I can't wait to put together on the show notes page. Please share the best, the best way for our listeners to find you. Oh, thank you, Lori. And thank you so much for, uh, like, you, you're a big part of um, helping entre- entrepreneurs, supporting us, and getting our ideas out there. So I just want to say thank you so much for putting your show on and uh, taking thank a step you. and just making it happen. That's awesome. So Thank if, you. if you don't want to get to know or got, get to know Ready to Grow a little bit better, it's just www.readytogrow with the number two in the middle uh, dot com. So readytogrow.com and, and there's information there and so on and there's ways to contact me if they would like to just have a chat. I love to meet with people on an informal basis with no cost or obligation just, as we, just so we can see uh, the different kinds of ways we can work together. And then I like to actually submit a proposal. So um, I don't bring people into programs and you know, kind of stuff them with content. What I do is I work with each one individually. 
And uh, so I'd love to talk with anyone who's interested. Lois, thank you, thank you, thank you once again for joining us today. Thank you so much again. Thank you once again for joining me, everyone here for episode number 30. I hope you guys truly enjoyed that episode. Lois dropped a ton of information and resources there on you guys. So I will be sure to link to all of that in the show notes page at technologyequality.com forward slash Lois Rats. Of course, you can always reach out to Lois at readytogrow.com if, in fact, you are looking to go ahead and begin working with Lois and, and get started on growing your business. Thank you, thank you, and until our next episode, when we continue to hear the journey, find the pain and create solutions, enjoy the week.